and welcome to Shift Remote Part 6, the conference where we bring together the brightest developers online for you, our incredible listeners. First off, a thank you to those of us that have joined us throughout this. You have stuck in. We are so grateful for your support. And secondly, a welcome to anyone new. For those of you that are new, I'm just going to run you through how this will work. My name is Bilal and I am your host for this conference, which just means that I'll be popping up every now and then to introduce our next speaker. We have four incredible speakers for you today over the next two and a half hours that we have together. In an hour and a half time, we'll take our five minute break, which is literally just a chance for you to grab a drink and get back in front of the screen so we can continue with our conference. Um, by way of introduction then, what I would love to say is that we will be using the chat section there on your screen where you can write throughout Give us a little thumbs up to let me know that that worked. Use that thumbs up emoji there in the chat and say hi. Maybe say hi in your native language because I know that we probably are from all over the world, which is a great benefit of being in this virtual space together. Now, I want to say a thank you to our sponsors before I pass you over to Ivan, who's going to tell us some more. Our sponsors who've made this possible. First off, a massive thank you to Microsoft, Infobip and Refizen Bank. Also, thank you to the team at Autodesk, Microblink, Barrage, Azure Idea, ICT, Japania, Venture, Pseudocode, 5, Ars Futura, Nanobit, Infinuum, Q, 9 Dots, Get By Bus, Aspira, Code Anywhere, Pluggy and Neto Krasija. Thank you because without you, this would not have been possible at all. So thank you for doing that. Now, with that out the way, all that's left to say from me for now is to pass you over to the man who started this all, Ivan Burazin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Shift Remote. It's been two weeks since our last event, and we've had a little break, but we're back in the game. So this week, we have two more. Uh, today, starting with JavaScript again. I know you guys love it so much, so we had to put in a second uh, event about the topic. And the speakers coming up today are just fantastic. I'm really super excited to have them here. Also, since we've last talked, we have the privilege of adding one more supporter to the remote series. Raiffeisen Bank of Croatia has decided to support us for the rest of the events. And I'm super happy to have them, like really excited that they decided to support us and support our vision and support what we're doing with Shift. And again, support you guys for enabling you to interact with these great speakers. In any case, also getting really close to our Shift Dev Open Air event in Split Croatia in just about seven weeks. Um, so stay tuned for that as well, and hopefully we'll see you there. Enjoy the show and talk to you soon. Thank you, Yvonne. And with that, that brings us to our first speaker for today's conference, who is a software engineer turned developer advocate at MongoDB. They come from what they've called the frozen tundra of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they said that it is really cold there. And no, not everyone has the accent from the movie Fargo. I think we'll find out if that's true. They have been primarily a Node and JavaScript engineer and have been writing, teaching and talking about code for their entire career. What I'd like you to do is put some fire emojis there in the chat and put your hands together wherever you are in the world. And we'll introduce Joe Carlson. Okay, hello, welcome to IoT and JavaScript. This is a basic introduction to IoT. Now this is a super fast version of the talk. I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, Great, my name's Joe. I work for a little company called MongoDB. I'm a developer advocate and a software engineer. I mostly work with JavaScript and Node. If you wanna follow any of the links I'm gonna be talking about, or the code, or video, or slides, or whatever, there's a bit.ly link in the upper right-hand corner of the slides. Also, bit.ly link down there at the bottom. Uh, if you wanna follow me, that's uh, my socials, whatever. And if I say anything controversial, that's not me, it's not my employer. Please don't get me fired. All right, thank you. Um, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I first want to introduce just IoT in general, and then I want to talk about um, JavaScript and IoT, and then I want to show you my awesome new project. IoT Kitty Litter Box. 
So what the heck is IoT? IoT is anything that you put a chip in it, anything that you can connect to the internet or as a toaster or a dishwasher or whatever. The internet with a bunch of stuff on it, right? But my favorite part about IoT isn't uh, like more of the practical side, I like kind of the stupid shit side of it, right? I like kind of like the weird art projects and the weird dumb stuff that comes about from IoT. But that's fascinating. It's the Wild West days right now of IoT and we're putting chips in everything. Some of it's cool, some of it sucks. I think it's all fascinating. Um, particularly using art. It's like us as developers, we're uniquely positioned to be able to explore this new media. Internet connected, like art works. Right? I think that that's fascinating. You know, like, artists aren't capable of doing the work like right? It's a whole new frontier. So, okay, IoT, it's super cool. I love it. I love the weird art part about it. Hope you do too. Um, okay, so why should you be picking Node and JavaScript for your next IoT project? Kind of weird, right? Because we don't typically think of Node and JavaScript when we think about IoT projects. Hardware has not been the realm of internet languages particularly JavaScript before, but why would you consider Node? Well, did you know that actually 58% of IoT developers self-identify as Node developers, as IoT developers? Did I say that right? 58% of IoT developers self-identify as Node I think that's a quorum. That's a lot of developers are already self-identifying as, as Node and IoT developers. It's a huge, that's a huge community. Also, Personal opinion time here. Don't please don't flame me. JavaScript's a wonderful choice for new developers jumping in, particularly if you've been using JavaScript like in your day job or at a boot camp or you've been teaching. Why make your life harder? You know what I mean? Like D and C plus plus have traditionally been used because they are much lighter weight and uh, you have to deal with all the memory management. JavaScript has this thing called a garbage collector. It makes it a little bit beefier to use on the system on chip. But chips are getting so much cheaper and bigger and easier to use. And using JavaScript on it, it doesn't. It makes it can make sense, right? Um, but especially if you're learning something, you're going to be learning a lot of new things, particularly with the hardware. Why make your life harder? Use the like the the software you are comfortable. With. You know, take it one step at a time. JavaScript and Node is super easy to update over a network. So traditionally with IoT projects, how you've had to update those is you have to actually take that chip in, plug it in, and reflash that firmware on it. With IoT projects with, built with Node and JavaScript, super easy. You just do a git pull and an npm install, and boom, right? You're updated. That's super easy to do remotely. Internet already speaks JavaScript. Whatever. It's like expanding out to so many things. Like, why stop there? Like, we're this continue the language of the web, continue to make it JavaScript. And you may not know this, but there's a ton of existing libraries and tools and APIs out there for JavaScript developers trying to make IoT fun. Two big ones today are Cylon.js and Johnny5. I'm actually going to show you Johnny5 in particular for my IoT kitty litter box. And lastly, I just want to talk about too how the architecture of JavaScript and Node particularly fits IoT projects. Why is that? Well, think about how you develop an IoT project. It's a event-driven. For example, like let's say you have a um, moisture sensor in your litter box to determine if it's been if it's dirty or not, right? You're waiting for some sort of moisture event to be triggered by your sensor, and then you want to have some sort of function or callback function that runs asynchronously. That is the foundation of how Node and JavaScript is built. It's all built on callback functions and waiting for these events to happen asynchronously. And the structure of JavaScript and the structure of real life event handling actually marries together supremely well. Okay, great. So Node and JavaScript, let's get to my favorite bit. My IoT kitty litter box. So uh, I like jumping into something practical. We're not gonna be able to have time here today to go into every nuts and bolts of it, but I do wanna show you some of the most interesting parts of it. And I wanna walk you through how I started to build this project to finishing it. So here's the actual finalized box. It's a little fancy. I got a little mid-century fancy box. You don't have to get one of these. Um, you can get like a $20 plastic reusable or like box on Amazon. You don't have to get this fancy, but I love mine, right? I think they're super fun. Uh, and how does this thing actually work, right? Well, so I have my box and I have a lid on it, right? That like sliding door and it's got a little sensor on it. And when that's, that door opens, that means the box is now in maintenance mode. 
When it's in maintenance mode, that means I'm either cleaning out litter or adding new litter to it. So the point is that base weight of that box is going to change. So when I close that box, it reinitializes a new base weight for the box, and then it waits. It waits for that event to happen. And the event for us is having a cat-sized object enter the box. It could be a raccoon, could be a possum, but I'm just waiting for an object that's approximately the size of a cat to enter that box. Once, and I can I detect that being using a um, their load cells. They're basically a internet connected bathroom scale I put underneath of the box. Waits for a weight to be added to that box. Okay, so we have a cat in the box. I wait a little bit, the cat to do its business, and then I take a passive measurement of my cat's weight and I send that off to the cloud. MongoDB database in the cloud, right? So I can save that for later. Um, and also take a timestamp of when that event happened, when the bathroom event happened. Um, I wait for the cat to leave. And once that wait leaves, I wait a little bit for everything to settle down again, like it's a minute. And then I reinitialize a new base weight of the box. And then I wait again for another cat size object in that box. Either wait for a cat to enter the box or I wait for a new maintenance event to start the process all over again. Okay, so it's pretty simple actually, right? That's pretty simple. Um, let's jump into some code. So, first step of any project. This is the most intimidating, I think, especially if you're a brand new IoT developer, but that's just getting your first thing to work. And with IoT projects, hello world of IoT projects is making an LED blink. Actually, see, this is my real project. You can see my load cells scattered around and you can see my Raspberry Pi um, 3B plus up there. You know, anything too fancy, but it worked for me, right? Um, and you can see my little LED on the breakout board. Getting an LED blink, just make sure that you have the, your, all of your wires, your chips initialized, and I have Node and um, Johnny5 all initialized correctly on my Raspberry Pi. It's like a, just a basic kind of checkup. It's the first thing you could do to like just check in the basic setup. So what does that actually look like? Well, glad you asked. So Johnny5 is a MPM library and Johnny5 works with a ton of different chips. I happen to be using Raspberry Pis. It's something I'm most comfortable with. And it's a, like a lightweight Unix-based system on there. So when I mess things up, I could go into the chip or the board and kind of like reconfigure stuff. It was a comfortable environment, right? I didn't have to learn everything brand new about the IoT project. So I'm basically telling Johnny5 like, hey, Johnny5, I'm working with a Raspberry Pi board here today. Cool, just so you know. So when I initialize Johnny5, I just say, Brand new John, or Raspberry Pi board, here we go. There's a callback function, right? We're waiting for that board to be ready, initialized. And then once that board is starting to listen to events, I initialize a brand new LED on P113. Now I have to look this up every time. That's on the GPIO, that's on the Raspberry Pi. There's these little pins that allow you to interact with inputs and outputs of data coming in out of your Pi. And I, I had to look up which one was the 13th, I don't know. Um, but I'm saying on this GPIO pin, the 13th pin, I have an LED connected out here. And Johnny5 is a built-in function that just says blink. That's it. That's it. That's the hello world, right? On the 13th pin, I have an LED and I want it to blink. That's it. Super easy. I think it's even easy for human beings to read this, which I think is so cool. Okay, so that's the hello world. Let's start making a toilet. So the first thing I want to do is build out the sensor to tell when I'm in maintenance mode. So I have a little magnetic switch that tells when the door is open or not. So I'm initializing the board just like we did before. The only difference is instead of initializing a LED, I have a switch on the 13th or on the 16th GPIO pin. So I'm just saying on this one, there's a switch and then there's two callback functions on either it's open or closed state. When it's opened up, do this thing. If it closed, do this thing. And we can see that actually in working here, so when I open up the, the box, you can see that little white thing screwed to the side. And I have my, my laptop hooked up. And you'll be able to see as I'm opening and closing that door, you can see I'm being registered on my laptop in real time. Cool. So pretty simple. It looks pretty similar to our hello world. And I can make, I can change states of the maintenance mode based on whether that door is open or closed. Okay, here's the fun fancy part. The load cells. Okay, so... Um, I use the spawn child process, which allows us to spin up a separate thread using node. I thought I've never used it before. It's super cool. But the thing is I had to use it because I couldn't actually find a Johnny five library that could work the load cells I purchased. So I did find one in Python and I used the spawn child process 
to actually spawn a Python process that actually goes and gets the weights and I can send it back up to my parent thread in Node. Super cool, I love this. This is the most elegant solution I could come up with, um, minus me actually just making the little cells work from scratch, but I didn't know how to do that. I, I'm still new at this, that's okay. Uh, and great, okay. That was the most complicated part. I wanna show how that works though. Ah! I love showing how this thing works. Um, so you can see the actual load cells are underneath of that piece of plywood in the box. And it's kind of hard to tell from this video, but I'm gonna be applying pressure to that, that piece of plywood and you'll be able to see on the terminal the weights being registered in real time. Every 10th of a second, I'm reading from that Python script running and getting the weight on those load cells. Yeah. Okay, I work for MongoDB, so I have to talk about this IoT time series data. So I designed my time series data to be readable in the form of a dashboard, right? So I wanted to be displaying all the data, which is super common for IoT use case. And it works really, really well for a document-based scheme. I just wanna show really fast what it looks like. I have some, the metadata about my box, cool. The other thing then, I have a, an array of event data. So I'm just, every day I create a brand new document in my MongoDB database. And then every single day, um, every single time I, I push a event to that event array for that current day's data, right? So over time, I just have these events and I can start doing amazing data analysis and data visualizations based on this. And it's super easy, super scalable and it's based on the way I'm designing it. I know document-based schema designs can be really complicated, but this is such an elegant solution, I think, and I love it, it's super great. Super great use case for MongoDB. So, next IoT project, you need to save some data? You should think MongoDB. All right, end of plug. Uh, this is the whole box assembly being put together. You can see my little Raspberry Pi there. I screwed it to the inside of the box, assembled it all up. I'm gonna plug it in right here, boom, eyes on, and that's it. All hidden, looks great, works awesome, use it every day. And there's my dumb cat sitting on top of the box. Okay, so if I, I've inspired you all to be a JavaScript IoT master or just IoT master in general, how do you do that? I say just do it. Get out there, make a stupid project, make, a, make an LED turn on and off. That's, that's it, right? Just start simple, start small, but make something. I think I want to be pushing all of us to be making more projects just for us. I think oftentimes, we're pressured to make side projects that are monetizable, but just do something, right? Especially if you're learning it, do what you can. Don't have to go too big. Do what you can and try to figure, make something cool just for you. You know what I mean? You should make something amazing. Okay, so that's it for me. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. I had so much fun. I hope I inspired you today to make something cool and amazing just for yourself. Um, all the resources can be found at that bit link. Here's some additional stuff you can find about IoT and JavaScript and MongoDB. Uh, and if you want to follow me, this is where you can do that. Thank you so much. You guys are the best. I love you so much. Goodbye. Hey everyone, welcome back after the break. Hopefully you can hear my voice and you haven't stepped too far away from your screen. 
this is your about five second cue to come back to your laptops because I am so pleased to make the announcement that on the 14th and 15th of September, we'll be having our in-person conference in Split. If you haven't registered already, this is our friendly reminder to find out more information online and make sure you register because we would love to see you there in person. Now, moving on. Our next speaker has been in development since the ancient times of 2009 and in mobile from the Android cupcake to iOS 14. They worked on enterprise apps with millions of users and startup apps with thousands with so much knowledge to share with us. I'm pleased to introduce Domagoy Rukavina. Hey everyone. Thanks for joining this talk. My name is Dom. I'm a senior mobile engineer here at Shoutem. And today I wanted to share with you what we learned by building mobile app platform on a React Native. So without further ado, I really had to pick my top two lessons that we learned by doing this. And there's quite a more, but that's for another day. And starting from zero index, let's talk about why we build an app platform in the first place and then top two lessons from that. So Gartner says that in the next four years, app development is going to primarily be happening on some kind of low code platform. This is happening for two reasons. First one, there's still a shortage of skilled developers on the market. And on the other side, there's even more demand than ever on digital services. And there just needs to be a tool to try and fill this gap. So we tried to fill this gap on, on mobile platforms. And we decided that we needed to build a WordPress for mobile apps. Kind of think of it as a WordPress for mobile apps. And we envisioned that we're going to use React Native as a foundation to do it. So. We wanted to have multiple reusable modules that we can install in every application and use them as we need them. Uh, let's say, for example, every app has some kind of a log login screen, or you have some kind of onboarding where you're showing the user what the app is actually going to do for them. There's quite a lot of functionality that you might be repeating from app from, from app to app. And we just wanted to have a concept where we wouldn't repeat ourselves. So follow the dry principle. The other thing we wanted to enable is give third party developers an option to add their own modules and use them in their apps. And finally, we wanted to enable people that are not skilled in development, they don't know code to come in and create an app that's going to fit their business purpose. So we created Shoutem. It's an app builder. You can create React Native apps in, in it. You can add your content, you can brand them, and you can publish them to both iOS and Android stores. And here's what we learned from that experience. So my number one lesson that I want to share with you is that React and React Native really evolved fast. Like if you worked on native platforms, you know there's a WWDC every year, so once a year, where you get an update on the platform and the frameworks that are going to be available to you. The same thing is happening on, on Android too. So the life cycle of, of a release is like one year. On React and React Native, that's really more frequent. Like. And this is like a pulse from GitHub, GitHub repo just for React, so the core library, core UI library. And it had 131 releases in the last seven years. So that's like having one to two releases per month. And yeah, most of them are patch versions, but here and then you're going to have a major update that's going to affect probably your whole app. On React Native, it's even more prominent. They had 347 releases in the last 
40, 64 months. That's like five and a half releases per month. That's quite a lot and it's evolving fast. And I actually created a quick chart of the number of releases per month in React Native from January 1st of 2017. As you can see, React Native team is really trying to have a one release per month, but some months there's even more releases as you get pre-release candidates or you have to patch some version num multiple times, like here at the start of 2019, where we had six patch versions for version 058 and three release candidates for version 059. So quite a lot of releases for you to track. And where I'm going with this is lesson number one, and that's don't underestimate the effort to keep up. You really, ne really need to follow this pace. Be agile and follow it fast. So if there's a new release, you really want to go and update as soon as possible because you want to grasp the changes quickly. Don't skip steps. What I mean by that is you will update React Native, but that's not the only dependency you have in your app, right? There might be dozens of others that also depend on some version of React Native. It's your job to go through all of them and keep them in sync. And finally, if you have a big app, you really want to invest in automated testing infrastructure. Otherwise, you're really risking having regressions in your builds because some things are changed and it can really crash an app or do something unexpected on a new version. And that brings me to lesson number two. I mentioned dependencies. So do we build something that's missing on React Native or do we let others do it and take a dependency? I'm going to give you an example in, in our platform. In 2016, our designers created this beautiful design system for all of the UI components in Shoutem. And we needed a UI component library that we want to use in each of our modules because we want to be consistent and to have really great UX and look and feel. So what did we choose to do? Well, we created one, right? We created Shoutem UI. That's our component library. And we had great success with it. Like you can see it has 4.6 thousand stars today. And it's really still one of the most used libraries. We also solved animations and we added theming and branding support to that. So we created quite a lot of software to support the use cases of our users. We also chose how to do state management and APIs. And where I'm getting with this is we were very opinionated. We thought that we know best how to solve everything and we gave you a solution. So what we learned from that experience is we really want to be more React way. This is not Angular. We're not going to choose everything for you, right? There's options and you want to have them. So make everything replaceable when doing a platform. And we did that, but it took us time to realize that we we're going in the wrong direction. Avoid having big abstractions, like avoid providing big solutions for everything in the app. Let people do what they want to do and keep it simple. And finally, by having an opinion on how things should be solved, you're really not focusing on dev adoption. You're focusing on people reading documentation and learning how to use your own platform. It's going to be great when they learn it, but you're increasing their effort to be able to provide something quick and be really productive. Hope this was really uh, insightful. And if you're going to be build a next app, app platform or a template or something, I hope this gave you a lot of advice. Thank you so much. And with that, I've got the pleasure of introducing our final speaker for this shift remote 
who is an independent front-end web developer, consultant, and educator. He's a co-creator of front-end application bundles, styled components, and CSS modules, as well as being the co-founder of Link and creator of Frontend Center. Let's welcome him in the chat with those clap emojis, Glenn Madden. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, even though we can't all be in the same place, it's really nice to still be involved. So thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Glenn Madden. Uh, that's me on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is the best place to get in touch with me if you have questions, although I will be uh, around afterwards for a Q&A and then in the chat room. So uh, if you have questions, you can hit me up there too. Um, just to give you some background, uh, you might know a couple of the open source projects that I helped to start, both of them in the CSS and JavaScript space. Uh, CSS modules was first. Um, it's a Webpack compiler that makes uh, working with CSS files in React and other um, JavaScript projects uh, a bit safer. Um, Styled Components is more of an ambitious project about uh, how to work with CSS and styling of React components. Um, I don't work on either of those projects anymore, but they have um, really good uh, maintenance teams. So if you've got questions, uh, they're both uh, good good projects to, to check out. Um, what I want to talk about today is my new project, something I've been working on for the last uh, couple of years, called Frontend Application Bundles, or FAB. Uh, and I kind of see it as a stepping stone to the next era of um, front-end development, sort of. Uh, I should also mention uh, that I run a, project, a product called Link. Uh, it's an automated deployment platform uh, for front-end projects. It uses fabs pretty heavily, and it's the reason I'm able to devote so much time to working on open source. So if you like the sound of fabs, do get in touch with me, and I'll talk to you about Link. That's all I'm going to say about it today, though. Uh, my talk today is sort of an argument for why front-end web development is kind of stagnating at the moment, or at least it's starting to really slow down, in my opinion. Uh, and we need something new to launch the next generation of technology and tooling and frameworks. It's also a bit of a story about why fabs exist and why I'm working on them and trying to get everyone to use them. Uh, I'm going to start with a story, something that, that shows how standards can be so important, and also kind of how they come to be, right? I want you to ask yourself this. What do you think is the most important invention of the 20th century, over the whole century, right? I mean, we have the internet, that's pretty important to us, but that kind of came later. Um, antibiotics is a pretty big deal. I mean, the semiconductor, um, that's got to be up there, right? Well, I'm going to say that there's an argument that the most important, transformative, impactful invention of the 20th century is a box. This box, right? Before the invention of this box, the story goes, if you wanted to send something you'd manufactured over to the other side of the world, the only way you could do that is just to grab it and throw it on the back of a truck or a train, and it would get driven, carried to the docks, and then each individual item would be thrown on the back of a boat, right? Some of the things would get damaged, some would get stolen. And at the other end of the process, uh, at the other end, the process would repeat itself. And it wasn't until someone, uh, this guy called Malcolm McLean, invented a box, right? Now you put stuff in the box, the box gets shipped, and everything arrives safely at the other end, right? Suddenly the whole world opens up. You can now manufacture anything anywhere and ship to anyone. And honestly, this box did change the world, right? The entire rise of global manufacturing owes itself to the success of this box. And the second half of the 20th century and the economic impact of global manufacture and shipping um, does have a decent claim to be the most important invention of the 20th century. But the story I told you isn't really correct because don't get me wrong, it was a good box. It's really nicely designed, it's very cheap to manufacture, and the corners are really clever. When you stack a bunch of them together, they lock in so it doesn't fall over on a long sea voyage. So it was a good box. But there were other boxes before it, right? It, it, it wasn't the first, it didn't invent the concept of boxes, right? That kind of thing is a bit ludicrous to think that we got to 1950 without using a box, right? It's not, the, it's not a better box that changed international shipping. 
The thing that was different about the intermodal container, which is what that box is called, uh, is that they gave the designs away. They gave the patents uh, to build them away. They let anyone build them for free, which is, I guess, the equivalent of a piece of open source software, right? It meant that these boxes became ubiquitous. It meant that everybody, it was easier for everyone to reuse the design of the box that worked for everyone than to invent their own. And it was that idea that had such a big impact. Because it turns out that the box didn't actually make shipping that much easier or uh, reliable. It changed the competitive landscape of global logistics. Before there was a standard shipping container, the only way anyone could improve the whole system would be big en- it would, was, be, was to be big enough to control enough pieces of the chain to roll out changes simultaneously. So things like centers of industry, like Liverpool or Manchester or Chicago, were able to roll out standards, or armies in the Second World War introduced a whole lot of innovation. But what the intermodal container did was it made everybody able to improve logistics by just focusing on building a better truck or a better train or a better boat or a better logistics system, right? That were compatible with the standard. And so once you take this massive global puzzle and you break it down so that each person can work on just a piece of it and they can compete to solve that piece better than anyone else, you kind of end up having the entire world working together to change itself. And that's the concept I think is really interesting. And we've actually seen something similar to that in the tech sphere, which is the the rise of Docker in the last uh, 10 years or so. Now, This is a front-end conference, that's fine. I'm I'm not expecting you to understand what Docker is. I honestly don't understand what it is most of the time, except that it runs my battery uh, down twice as fast when it's running. So uh, the high-level overview will be enough, right? Uh, The idea before, you would have servers that are specific for a particular type. Of, of code. So you'd have a database server and you put database code on it. You would have Rails server running Ruby or a, um, a, a Django server running Python uh, or a Node.js server running JavaScript, right? And to customize a server to make it kind of Node.js specific, it's just a matter of taking a blank server and installing Node on it. But the thing is, once you've got that machine and it's configured, then the next time you need to deploy JavaScript, you take the machine and you update the code on it. You don't just build a whole new machine. And that leads to sort of some edge cases that end up making things a little bit more unreliable. Docker comes along and says, hey, instead of actually, you can see the the lineage of the container, um, of the shipping container um, concept in the Docker logo. And it says, instead of just taking the code, take the code as well as everything it needs to run. So take JavaScript and Node.js, take uh, your Ruby and your Rails, and you pop it in a container. And then on the server side, you just have these blank canvases, these empty vessels where you can put any code in. And then when it's time to update it, it's just as easy to build a whole new machine with the new version of the code and switch the new traffic to it, which makes upgrades much more reliable and, and rollbacks much more um, straightforward. It's obviously a bit more complex than this, but it's been profoundly successful. It runs everywhere and has changed the landscape of a backend hosting over the last 10 years. And if you aren't a backend engineer yourself, um, if you speak to anyone, they will probably agree that Docker has had a massive impact. Um, But like the intermodal container, Docker didn't invent the idea of containerization, right? There were things called virtual machines. And... Actually, there's a lot. This is from uh, Docker's uh, documentation page. There's a lot written about how Docker is a better box than virtual machines. Virtual machines are bigger. They have the whole operating system. They are better, right? They're definitely better. But that's not, I think, the important part. The important part is that before Docker came along, the companies in the space that were innovating with virtual machines were doing amazing stuff. They're really doing cool stuff. But they weren't help. Well, they weren't really sharing anything. They were competing to provide the basic virtualization technology. Right now, with Docker, the companies haven't really changed, and they're still competing. Except now, they're all building on top of a standard, and it means that the people who benefit are us, the users, because they're now no longer wasting time just trying to copy what each other's doing 
because they have a standard in order to build it on, uh, on, on top of. Which brings me to front-end applications, right? So what does this look like for front-end apps? And it's worth mentioning that you can use Docker in exactly the way that Docker is designed to ship front-end applications, but it's not really designed for it. And I don't know if you've seen this uh, tweet before, but I absolutely love it, right? You end up shipping, um, using infrastructure and using technology that's designed for enormous applications, hundreds of machines running all different kinds of tasks in order to ship a few lines of HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And it does feel like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Um, but more importantly, Docker's been around long enough that it was a, if it was a good fit technologically for front-end apps, it would have been successful by now, right? And actually, if you look at the platforms that have been successful for front-end hosting, uh, there is sort of an emerging de facto standard that's coming around there, which is the concept of static hosting, or, or it's been coined uh, Jamstack. They're all either focusing heavily or they only support static hosting, right? Now, if you're not familiar with the term Jamstack, it means um, that you use JavaScript APIs. So, um, Sorry, it stands for JavaScript, APIs, and markup. And it basically means you run things in the client, i.e. JavaScript, and you push all the dynamic pieces into APIs. And then the only thing you actually need your hosting provider for is the markup or the static HTML. And it actually works really well for a bunch of use cases. And there are parts like moving stuff off to the APIs that are great and don't need changing. But I kind of see Jamstack as the best that we can do if you can only host static files. And that's actually exactly how it originated, right? And while it might be okay for the projects we have right now, it sort of closes the door to any real innovation in the future. I've um, collected a couple of tweets from people um, that are in this sort of vein um, in lieu of real projects that are showing progress in this space. Uh, Dan Abramov, who I'm sure you'll be uh, familiar with, talks about the idea of a middle way, of a framework where you don't need to choose upfront whether things run on the client or the server, and that you can choose later to gradually move things that need to be client-side or need to be server-side, or, or not need to, but are just better. Um, Max Stoiber, a friend of mine and, and um, the co-creator of Styled Components, talks about the eventual server uh, future of server-side being mostly server, but with just client-side for interactions, right? So this is an idea that's slightly more extreme, putting things onto the, um, uh, almost all onto the server. And I actually think David uh, uh, Capiano has um, uh, summarized this the best, which is that most of your pages can probably be static and they can probably be server rendered. Um, and then you can inject dynamic functionality on top of it. That's actually kind of hard to do right now. And it's sort of impossible unless you have a really good server-side hosting story. Now, the other thing is that um, this is a couple of years old now and I believe the React team has moved on, but, but this is uh, Andy Clark from, from the core React team talking about a potential future of a streaming server renderer where it's all React on the server, but when it sends down to the client, it's a bunch of little script tags and it uses a, a long uh, running HTTP connection to gradually hydrate the page, um, meaning that if a slow client is accessing a website, they could have a, an entirely server rendered experience. And if a client comes in with plenty of CPU and RAM and, and a gigabit network, then you may as well just dump the whole application to them and say, hey, you know, go nuts. You can, you've got this, right? These sorts of hybrid approaches, I think, are gonna offer an incredible advancement of, of the experience and, and an experience that tailors itself to the capabilities of the user at the time but they're not possible unless you move away from static hosting. Now, the other thing I wanted to make, uh, the other point I wanted to make is that the static host that we have, it's not really a, a standard because static hosting, there's more to static hosting than just static files, right? So if you look at Netlify's config to do anything beyond static and, and almost all sites will need some um, non-static behavior like a redirect or a proxy, these things uh, end up being specified in a 
platform specific config file, right? Which is fine. That's a great way of doing it, except it's not portable, right? So adding a few preload headers, um, it means that if you have a Netlify site that has all these extra advancements, you don't have a portable standard. You have a bunch of static files and a bunch of config files. And if you want to move that, then you, you have to rewrite the config files. And actually, even all of these um, appear like they support Jamstack, you're actually more locked in than you might think, right? But what I think about the landscape right now is that it feels like what the backend landscape used to look like before Docker, right? Or international shipping before the container, right? These, all these companies are, um, or all these products are expending so much effort just to replicate what each other does, right? And the only people who can really innovate are somebody, are, are platforms that control enough of the stack. So something like Versal, which used to be called Zeit and renamed recently, uh, that control Next.js. So they've done some incredible work with their hosting platform that's tied into Next.js's language features, right? Framework features. They're the only people who can do that and they're doing a great job. My problem is that they're the only people that can do it. Which brings me to my project, right? Front end application bundles. And I think if you wanted to summarize it in one sentence, it would be, what if hosting dynamic code was just as easy as hosting static code, right? The Fab project is about unifying static and dynamic code. So it doesn't matter what you're, whether you're doing Jamstack, single page apps, full server rendering, or a normal JavaScript app with a bit of logic on the, on the server. Maybe you're doing a proxy or a redirect. Maybe you're checking a cookie before serving a particular page. These should all be just as easy as each other, and it shouldn't require you changing your hosting to do it. So with Fab, you don't need to worry so much about which framework you're using or even which features of that framework you're using. As long as you can compile it to a Fab, you know you can host it the exact same way on any provider. The goal of Fab is to support any front-end project, including server-side rendering, and run it anywhere you can run JavaScript. And that's different to running Node.js. Now that's a whole section of the talk, which I don't have time to go into, uh, just to say that um, being able to run it inside a JS container, not Node.js, makes it much, much more port portable and performant. Um, and so that's a that's a constraint of Fabs. Inside a Fab, a Fab is just a zip file, and it has two components, a server.js and an assets directory. If you have a fully static site, your server.js will be very, very small, just a few redirect rules, that sort of thing. But as you do more things, the fab tooling makes it easier and easier to bring in libraries and write code that runs on the server and still deploy it in the same way, right? We, uh, Docker, when it came out, it didn't really invent a bunch of the technologies that it, it ended up using. It just reused them in a, in a good way. Uh, Fab's doing the same thing. Like we're standing on the shoulder of Webpack to do this stuff um, and we wouldn't be able to without it. On the um, asset side, it's all guaranteed immutable um, and content addressable, meaning it can be cached forever and stored anywhere you want, super cheaply, super easily. Um, and there's a bunch more design things that it's all on the Fab Dev um, website. When it comes to deploying, you can either combine those two parts back into the original Fab and deploy them to somewhere that can host both, right? But what's unique about Fab is the idea that even though Fab is the standard, it can actually be better to split up the server.js and the assets file um, and st uh, store them in different places. So for example, assets and S3 are a perfect match because S3 can, you know, is infinitely scalable and it's always there. Dumb as a post, but it doesn't fail. Um, Cloudflare workers, on the other hand, um, even though they do have a, um, a storage uh, story, they're the best platform in the world for executing JavaScript. Right? They're just super fast, super cheap. They're super awesome. If you haven't um, checked them out, you definitely should. And actually, the, the demo on the Fab page um, uses them, so that's probably the, the place I would start. And being able to take that file and split it up into two you know, really optimized platforms for that task means that if you're developing Fabs, you're getting the best of both worlds. And if a better server file, a server host comes along, just switch to it. And if a better asset host comes along, just switch to it. Right. That's what fabs can do. So I'm not going to tell too much about the details because it's on the document. And if I haven't convinced you so far, um, 
uh, then <laughs> there's not much more to say. Uh, but I will point out that the easiest way is to just jump into one of your projects and run npx fab in it, right? That will um, uh, detect which kind of framework that you're running and generate the con config files and help you through the whole process. If it doesn't detect yours, uh, send an issue. Um, it's, it's very easy for me to add new frameworks and detect them, that sort of logic. I've done a bunch now. So uh, the idea is that we want um, anyone who wants to experiment with a fab um, that is using an existing framework should just have a no config kind of experience. Um, these are the, the commands that are available. Um, you Obviously, the init is the autoconf thing. Then you build, you can serve locally, or you can deploy to a target. I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go into them. One thing I did want to mention is that everything inside Fabs is broken down into small plugins, and the whole Fab uh, ecosystem is designed for people to contribute small pieces of functionality that are relevant to everybody. So, for example, if you wanted to have a... Um, uh, something that optimized images, right? That could take a, a fab and generate WebP versions of that. There, in things like Gatsby and Next.js, there are plugins that will do that. And I think fabs have the opportunity of having a different level to actually add those those plugins. So it doesn't actually matter what framework that you're running. You can just get these server side benefits um, by optimizing at the fab layer. If you're interested, fab.dev is the website and the um, on that homepage, there is an 11 minute um, screencast where I go through basically the whole fab story and it's the best place to get started. Watch that. And then from there, you should have a, um, a good understanding of how all the tools fit together um, and that sort of thing. Um, you can go to the GitHub page and, and see the progress there, or you can jump on this link into our Discord. Um, but with that, I think I'm out of time. So thanks very much. Thank you, Glenn. And with that, that brings us to the end of another Shift Remote. Now, we are halfway through already. I can't believe it myself. But we'll be back again for part seven in just two days' time. If you haven't registered already, please do. We look forward to seeing you then. But without further ado, from us here at Shift, all that's left to do is to say thank you to you, our incredible listeners, and another thank you to our supporters at Microsoft Infobip. Verizon Bank, Autodesk, Microblink, Barrage, Azure Idea, ICT, Japania, Venture, Pseudocode, 5, Ars Futura, Nanobit, Infinuum, Q, 9 Dots, Get By Bus, Aspira, Code Anywhere, Pluggy, and Netocratia. Without you, none of this would be possible. If you've loved us, please do use the hashtag Shift Remote wherever you can on social media. Goodbye from us at Shift, and we'll see you again soon.